So hello and welcome. Happy Friday. Today is Friday, January the 28th, and this is episode number 144 of Backyard Beekeeping Questions and Answers. It is 19 degrees Fahrenheit outside, which is minus 7 Celsius, lots of snow. And my name is Frederick Dunn, and I'm glad that you're here, and this is the way to be. So I'm glad you're here. If you're new, welcome. If you're a repeat customer, repeat viewer, thank you for coming back. Uh, I'm glad that even though you've seen me before, you've come back. That's an endorsement. Heavy snow, deep snow. The dreaded short-tailed shrew is still out there hunting the countryside. If you don't know what that's about, you need to watch my landing board uh, cleaning video. The other thing is, uh, questions and topics that we're going to hit on today will be down in the video description in order. And then later, of course, there'll be a pinned comment that will have the timestamps associated for those of you who don't want to watch the whole thing, although I can't imagine why you wouldn't want to. Uh, but you can go directly to the topic. It's also available on Podbean as a podcast called The Way to Be. So if you just Google podcast, The Way to Be, you'll find it. I want to share something else with you. I have a brand new coffee mug today. Nature's Image Farm, the Contrary Farmstead podcast. That was hand delivered. There's a really cool interview coming up, and I'll be linking that, of course, later, hosted by Greg. And uh, we'll see how that goes. So that's a lot of fun. Anyway, let's jump right in today and see what's going on. The first question comes from Ben Helsing's Legacy. That's the YouTube handle there. My mom's been checking our hives daily. They're in the backyard, not mine. And today she's found a massive die-off with what she guesses to be a thousand bees, with many still moving. It's the warmest day at minus 11 Celsius we've had in a week. So I'm guessing that the live bees are taking out the trash, or maybe some of them are not making it back to the hive. I suggested she clear the dead bees from the actual entrance, but leave them on the landing board so anyone still alive that wasn't crawling out to die still has a chance to make it back in. Am I right? Am I on the right track with that? And uh, this is the much stronger of our two hives and the other hive, which is by no means a small hive, the other one just grew like crazy, has more like what we've come to expect in dead bees. So this is a time, timely question too, of course, because we're in January and there's lots of snow. And some people actually climbed up on me about uh, even suggesting that people should go out and clear the dead bees. Okay. I suggest that you do. And here's why. What if you're wrong? The comment was, they'll take care of that themselves. This is all rubbish for you to go out and show people to clear their entrances. Bees don't need to do that. The quote went on to say that uh, people in Canada are doing it and they don't fool around with that. Okay, so here's the thing. Let's just fail safe. So if you watch me, then I make suggestions that maybe you could waste your time doing it. Maybe if the snow piles up, the bees will still manage to push air through there and vent just fine on their own. And just maybe they'll still survive even though dead bees pile up at the entrance and make it very difficult for the healthy colony, the bees that are inside, to still get in and out of the hive. But what does it hurt if you go out there with your hive tool, if only I had one handy, and get in there and clean out those entrances and make sure they have a clear shot in and out without difficulty? Have you caused harm by clearing out the entrances of dead bees and scraping off some of the snow at the entrance. You have not. Now, what's the risk if you don't do it? One out of 20 of your colonies may end up with enough dead bees against that entrance, blocking the exit of the bees inside the colony so that when things warm up, they actually can't get out. Plus, ventilation is reduced at the entrance, which is the only source of ventilation in my hives. And the bees that are trapped in there may end up eliminating inside instead of being able to fly out and eliminate in the snow and away from the hive, which is what they all try to do. Also, bees that are mobile try to get out of the hive regardless of the weather if they're at the end of their life. So they will fly out and often you find them dead right in front of the hive. So which would you rather do? 
Take a chance that you might have wasted some time going out looking at your hives and assessing the landing board and entrances or risk not clearing out an entrance where bees could ultimately die and it's happened before. So I don't consider that to be a rubbish move. <laughs> so I think it's a good practice. Also, you're checking up on your hives. They could be tilting, they could be wind damaged, things could shift. You want to be aware of what's going on with your beehives. And again, with this deep snow where I am, it's helpful that they're high off the ground. So 18 inches off the ground keeps them out of skunk range. Maybe you don't have skunks. But if you have deep snow, this ties in also. Because when your bees fly out, if the first thing they encounter is snow, or the snow is, here's the entrance, and the snow is actually deeper than the entrance, they have to fly up and over that to do a cleansing flight. And we know that we've lowered the bees to the ground because we have to do maintenance on them. But the actual colony of bees, if given their own choice regarding where to occupy a cavity, it would be up high somewhere. Uh, we don't find bee trees with holes in the sides of them occupied by bees down at snow level. For obvious reasons, because it opens them up to a lot of predator activity. But we're managing these colonies in man-made hives. They're already low to the ground. I don't know what, you know, it would look like out there if my bees sat on the ground. So if the hives were directly on the ground with nothing but a bottom board spacing them off the ground, a couple of things happen. We have a lot of moisture underneath. Some people would say that's a good insulating value. But when we get these snow events that the bees can't keep up with, and the temperatures drop, in this case, into the negative numbers, we have that even coming up later this week, this weekend. So as the temperatures drop below zero, so now we're into the minus 10, minus 11, minus 12 Fahrenheit. Uh, if the snow is banked all around the hive and the bees are warming and trying to vent through there, which normally they can get that little air space up through there, and I've videoed that in the past, but with these temperatures, it can start to melt the snow there, but these cold temperatures can freeze it again because at some point, that warm air coming out of the hive is gonna cool again, and now we've got an ice pack up against your hive. This is why I always recommend inspecting for snow load, look for dead bees, keep the airway open, which is the hive entrance, and uh, clean that out manually. And if we have, if the snow just keeps coming, then you're gonna have to go out there every day or so, if you can. So, but the higher your hive is off the ground, the better it is in climates like mine here in Pennsylvania. But the question here is, uh, putting the bees on the landing board so they can crawl back in. Uh, we've all collected dead bees, if you do, collect bees off your hives in winter. Clear your entrances, always just you just when you find the one hive they might be dying off okay so we clean them off if you find bees dead in the snow like a lot of people you see the bee struggling in the snow and you're like i want to catch that bee and put it back on the hive that it came out of only to see it fly off and land in the snow again uh, the higher they are the more chance they have to fly out and get back if it's warm enough particularly if the sun is shining and statistically although there may be exceptions Statistically, in the northern hemisphere, south-facing landing boards do better with this. The snow melts off on its own quicker, they're clearer, and of course those with hive visors or any kind of extension over the front of your hive that collects the snow and keeps it off the landing board gives it a benefit. Because the other thing too is, people that say, well, the wild hives don't do that. Yeah, they don't, because they don't have landing boards. A wild hive, a feral colony in a tree, just has a flat-faced entrance. And I made this comparison when I walked through the bee yard and showed the hive configurations that do not have landing boards right up to the entrance. One of those would be the lands hive, flat front. No snow buildup, no blockage. Also, the entrance on the lands hive is up off the bottom by several inches. So dead bees inside would pile up on the bottom and not block the entrance. Therefore, Trouble free, doesn't need cleaning out. The horizontal hive, also the way I did that entrance, I put it several inches off the bottom, a very small landing board below the entrance, so not on the same level as with a standard bottom board. So now the snow collects there, plus there's a visor over the entrance which collects most of the snow, and they did not need cleaning out. The other thing was the uh, nucleus colonies that I have. So the nucleus boxes that are out there are the ones without landing boards. They just have the control wheel on the front. 
They have no landing board and they have a front facing three quarter inch diameter entrance and it again is off the bottom. Zero maintenance for that hive. So those don't need snow cleaning. So which ones do need the cleaning out? The Langstroth hive configuration with a standard bottom board and that extension off of the front needs a clean out and needs to be inspected. The Flow Hives, the Flow Hive Standard, the Flow Hive 2, and the Flow Hive 2 Plus version all have an angled uh, landing board on the front. They still need to be cleared out, although again, the south facing landing boards on those did not require a clean out, nor did the east facing uh, landing boards on those hives. So flat bottoms, they should all be tilted towards the entrance, by the way, towards the landing board, so any water that accumulates inside there can run out. And another viewer reported that the nucleus colonies that have just the hole in the front, and then of course that space between the hole and the bottom, which is good for collecting the dead bees and keeping them from blocking the hole, but because it was tilted forward, condensation inside that hive ran to the front and he detected water inside there. So I suggested drilling small weep holes in that bottom board so moisture could run out through the bottom. You're not losing or risking the loss of the heat capsule they've created up above because this venting and drainage is through the bottom. So I hope that helps with some of that thinking. Now the other thing is leaving dead bees on your landing board that's fine. Their chances, unless the sun shines or something like that, their chances of being revived and getting back inside are kind of low. Um, there's a reason why they're on the landing board to begin with. Many of us uh, collect the dead bees off the bottom, put them in a Ziploc baggie, and if you're like me, you take them into your kitchen and you put them on white plates and you start to look them over and uh, only to have some revive and fly to the window. Are those bees healthy enough to where they would have made it back inside the hive and if they were in the hive would they have been back up in the cluster so they're kind of in a state of independent torpor do you have anything to lose by leaving them on the landing board as long as they're not blocking the entrance not really you could do it and in the event that they do climb back inside they could crawl back up and they could rejoin the uh, outer mantle of the cluster of bees for winter so you know, it's, you're not wasting your time necessarily, probably, if they do make it. Will those be the healthiest bees in that colony? Likely not. But uh, you will have done your part, and it probably feels good to the beekeeper to do that. So clear the dead bees, and I'm on the right track. That is totally fine. And the stronger of two hives. Here's what's kind of uh, counterintuitive for a lot of beekeepers. Uh, I've gone to a small configuration going into winter, and that's because I'm following Dr. Thomas Seeley's recommendations on hive size and what the bees can manage in this climate. And it's perfect for me because where I am in Pennsylvania, laterally you go over to the Arnott Forest region and places where um, Ithaca is, and that's the climate that Dr. Seeley's talking about. So what he shares and talks about is pretty relevant to what happens here where I live and keep my bees. So because historically I've had these super colonies, four boxes, five boxes full of honey, and I thought I was just doing the right thing and really going to nuke it out as far as the food resources go by leaving all that honey on. And then I would just harvest the leftover honey in spring, and the colony would be huge population-wise. That colony, year after year, would fail. And the irony of that is... The tiny colonies, the tiny clusters, the softball size collection of bees in a small box. This is, this is critical as far as their ability to survive in the container that they're in. We know that they don't heat the box. It's not like setting up a furnace in your house and heating all three levels of your house. They heat the cluster, and in the middle of the cluster is the most critical heat, which is for any brood that they might be keeping. So the low end of that on the brood would be 94 degrees Fahrenheit. So they are generating energy, they're using calories to keep whatever brood cluster size they have alive. And I found that some of these small colonies in the small boxes had small brood, but a continuous brood. So that they were just gradually replenishing their numbers as they hoped to hang on and get through spring. And they did. And then my huge colony just would, everything is magnified. The amount of resources they consume, the amount of condensation that goes down to the bottom, the number of dead bees inside the hive if you're not cleaning them out. And that's the other thing 
that uh, is worth talking about. This hive tool, and it doesn't matter what you use, you can use a coat hanger for all I care, but it's the length of it. So as you go through the entrance here, you're going all the way to the back and pulling all the bees out. Historically, all I did was get my chopsticks out, get my kebab sticks, whatever I was using. These are kebab sticks. I put them in, how far did they go? This far, and then I just put them into a V and pulled out bees right next to the entrance to make sure the entrance is open. I think the advantage is in being able to dig in with this all the way to the back and scoop out more dead bees and reduce the amount of condensation and the degradation of that biomass in the bottom that uh, would not exist on the same plane as their entrance in a natural cavity. So that's the other comparison in a natural cavity, like in a tree where the entrance is located, you see this dip beneath the entrance. So there's a gap there, there's a space there where all that detritus would collect below and away from the entrance. So again, any condensation down there and things like that, it's likely propolized inside a tree. Uh, that stuff accumulates away from it. So there again, for people that are thinking, well, there's no reason to do that because they don't do it in the wild. Right, but if you look at those configurations in the wild, in a tree, no landing board, a space beneath, no risk of blocking their entrance. So there are differences, and I feel like you risk nothing by putting out that extra energy. So, uh, just like crazy, more like what we've expected in dead bees. So the dead bee die-off, if you have a massive die-off, your colony could be in trouble. And I think we have another question later today where I'll talk a little bit more about that cause causes of those mass die-offs. So question number two comes from Sherry Mitchell, Franklin, North Carolina. I just figured out perhaps the reason for my dead hive, it was most likely a rookie mistake on my part. I'd been putting diatomaceous earth around the hive in November. After I had started putting solid sugar in the top sugar for winter, I only put it around the bottom lip and was careful not to get it in front. But I'm embarrassed to say I feel it did them harm eventually. I did read prior to that it could be used, but then also read later on only on the ground. Pretty sure it was a huge mistake. As I have learned the hard way, it apparently affected them greatly. Again, as mentioned before, no way to know until I inspect the hive in about a month when the weather warms up. I'm grateful I will be able to do a walk-away split in the spring for my other hive and I appreciate any input you have. So DE, you hear this discussed a lot, discussed a lot. DE is diatomaceous earth, diatoms, single-celled plants that have fossilized, that have crystallized. And if you look at them underneath a microscope, they look like little razor shards, like little razor blades. And this is how they work. It's a mechanical means of destroying insects, and it's through desiccation. And what that is, is it lacerates the cuticle. A lot of people say, well, it lacerates their skeleton and it chops through it. No, it doesn't. It can't. It physically couldn't. It damages the cuticle. And even honeybees have a waxy cuticle on their bodies, on their exoskeleton, and this is what prevents the bee from dehydrating. It also prevents, it reduces moisture's ability to penetrate the outer shell of the bee and to get into it. So it's a critical thing, and it's one of the things that gets defeated when bees or other insects are put into solutions like that Dawn Ultra dish detergent, which is what we use to get the mites off of the bees for mite counts now. But once that waxy cuticle is damaged, then they can dehydrate, so they can lose moisture, which it otherwise was containing. They're prone to infection because it's also an infection barrier on the bee, and uh, the bees can absorb moisture, get wet, and then become sick, of course. So we use diatomaceous earth, and by me, I say we like poultry keepers, for example. It has this very dry aspect to it, for example. If you put a pound of diatomaceous earth in a cup, for example, like that, you put a pound of diatomaceous earth in there, you put a pound of water in there, it still behaves like a powder. That's how absorbent it is. So one of the ways that this works is people use it to get ants under control, let's say. 
So they're crawling along and, they, and the ants crawl across and it gets on their bodies and it starts rubbing on their bodies. It's not cutting into the exoskeleton of the ant. It's destroying the cuticle. So ants track it back home. Ants get it all over their body. They go into their holes and they're also interacting now with their own larva. So a larva, larvae collectively, uh, if diatomaceous earth gets on that stuff, it also absorbs moisture. So it dries it out. This is critical for developing soft bodied uh, ants. And ants, by the way, are social insects related to the bees. So now this is where it comes in. I'm kind of giving you the background on it because I want it to work on chickens. Chickens are totally not harmed by diatomaceous earth. And I always use food grade. So I put it all over their bodies and that's to control any kind of poultry mite. So there's feather mites, any kind of mite or flea that might get into a chicken house, especially in the nest boxes and things like that. I fluff diatomaceous earth all through there. Now, when it comes to bees, because it is, it's a mechanical insecticide. So it's non-chemical. It's not like it's going to go through the air and then kill or impact your bees. And the reason I'm explaining all of this is because often people will hear you've got varrodestructive mite, destructor mites, put diatomaceous earth in there, it'll take care of them. Uh, so here's what I recommend to people. Don't put diatomaceous earth anywhere inside your hive. And that includes bottom boards, trays, even trays under screens. And the reason for that is it has the consistency of talcum powder. And that's why you have to look at it under a microscope to even see these little shards and sharp edges and see what the diatom even looks like. So when the bees are fanning heavily inside your hive, they would be dusting up inside. So I recommend, and as, as you said here near the end of the comment, you were told only on the ground. I agree with that. Keep it out of the hive, keep it off your landing boards, keep it away from the perimeter, and don't put it inside the hive and definitely don't put it up inside of your inner cover on top of your hive, which I've heard of people doing as a means of controlling small hive beetles. If you want to control small hive, small hive beetles and their larvae, then you definitely want to be using traps and things like that. Diatomaceous earth should not be in. So this is my opinion, but I'm giving you the reasoning behind that opinion. Uh, why even work against your bees at all when there are other means available to deal with the threats that we're talking about. So when it comes to ants around your hive, once again, depends on where you live as to what species of ant is up in the hive. But for the most part, the reason ants are climbing up and going into your beehive, you're going to find them on your inner cover. You're going to find them in the back. Ants are seeking a place to be where they can raise their brood, where they can pirate the warmth that's already being generated by the bees. Ants like nectar, just like other insects do. So it would also be benefiting from that, but it's very rare in the northern part of the United States for ants to go in and take over a beehive. So it's kind of a non-threat, right? Now, other species of ants, I don't know, in the deep south and things like that, I don't know what fire ants would do to a beehive or anything else, but the northern areas, it's not that big a deal. But if you want to control that, look into ant-proof stands and things like that. If you spread diatomaceous earth around the base of your beehive, and you can do that, right? And it will work on ants, but guess what you have to continually do? You have to continually replenish the diatomaceous earth because when it rains or you get heavy dews, like where I live, we get a heavy dew, uh, it defeats the function of the diatomaceous earth, which is number one, to destroy the waxy cuticle or slice into it enough where moisture penetrates or more effectively where moisture would then be lost from the insect into the diatomaceous earth. So it dries them out. If it becomes moist, it can't do that anymore. So it's defeated and has to be replenished every time there's a heavy dew, every time there's a rain. So I think diatomaceous earth as a means of controlling pests around beehives is way overrated. When it comes to inside your poultry house and things like that, I think it's great because it definitely works because a lot of the fleas, feather mites, and things like that that are on the chickens or have the potential to be there are tiny soft-bodied insects, especially their underbody, 
and they can suffer and die from diatomaceous earth. Also, they avoid it. So good for chickens, marginal for bees. And if you need it to take out the ants, you have to question, what are the ants doing to your bees? And what is the real reasoning behind why you have to do anything to get rid of the ants? Water moats and things like that. The Flow Hive Pro Plus has little built-in ant moats on all four legs. So I'm sure there's lots of YouTubes that would show you how to make an ant moat. But there again, those need maintenance. They dry out. The ants bridge over them. Once there's a bunch of dead ants, they clamber over each other's bodies. And off they go again to get inside the hive to pirate warmth and sometimes nectar resources. So my opinion is put diatomaceous earth nowhere inside your hive. Number three, da, 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 da. Sherry Mitchell, Franklin, North Carolina. I'm a first year beekeeper. I've done extensive research research before I got my first two nukes last April. Nukes are nucleus colonies, usually five frames. Had two great colonies this year and I visit my hives almost daily to observe them. I did my treatments for mites in August and September. Didn't do a mite count last year, but I plan to start so I can be more accurate going forward. So one of my hives has been decreasing gradually over the last two months, and it did have a small pile of dead bees when I first noticed it. I clean the bees entrance weekly and do get a handful each time when the weather is above 50. The other hive is flying, but this one is not. So the last warm day, I did open when the other hive was active and found the cluster. But not one bee was moving in the hive, so I quickly closed it back up. Okay, now I'm going to stop right at this point because this is a lengthy question, but I want to always tell people, no matter where you live, what is the reason behind opening your beehive in wintertime? Out of just pure curiosity? Or do you actually have something that you plan to do when you open it? This is why I'm a big fan of top feeding in winter. So if you've got a fondant, if you're feeding dry sugar, sugar brick, whatever you're doing, having that on top is best because you do not expose the brood in your colony or the cluster to cold air in wintertime when checking feed. So when you open it, you can add feed without removing the old feed just as it's getting thin and things like that. So you don't vent off that valuable heat capsule that they've produced in the upper parts of the hive. If you're top venting or if you have a top entrance and things like that, even in winter, that heat capsule does not exist. So my question on here is, I opened it when it was the last warm day. When you guys are submitting comments or questions like this, Please identify what you consider to be a warm day. Was it 55 degrees? Was it 60 and sunny, cloudy? What was going on? Because those conditions are all important for you to log in your log books so that you will know maybe cause and effect because you saw the cluster, but none of them were moving. And this is interesting too. And this is kind of like the bees that people sweep off of the bottom and go to throw them away. And then 20 bees are climbing out. They were still alive. Because in this cluster, in that state of torpor, because they don't truly hibernate. So in that state of torpor, they are immovable and they act like they're dead. But here's what I want you to think about. They're still in a formed cluster. There doesn't have to be any movement. And uh, unless you have thermal capabilities, you don't know if they're warm or not, or if they're generating heat or what's going on. But what is going to be in the center of that cluster, the brood that they're trying to keep alive, and also in that area, those fat-bodied winter bees that are the nurse bees for the winter brood, and also the queen's going to be in there. We don't want to chill that area at all. So if we're just popping open the hive because we want to see, because we just have to know what's going on, because we're humans and we just like getting knowledge for the sake of the knowledge, uh, there's no reason to open the colony to find out what's going on. The risk is that if we're below what temperature? What temperature are they keeping there? Uh, brood at 94 minimum it's 94 to 97 so anything below that will cause them to expend energy to keep that brood warm so we have to really think about how important is this is it for us to look inside and see what's going on 
So then moving on, the next day I saw activity in both hives, so I assumed they were in torpor when I peeked in. Then today I was observing and I noticed the other hive's bees were the ones coming in and out of this hive. So I'm guessing they are starting to rob it. Not many bees robbing, but enough for me to notice. Here's step two. We need to make sure because this is coming up in springtime, your stronger colonies are going to be sending out their foragers when it hits 50 degrees or warmer. And, and then what are they going to be looking for? Resources that really are not yet existing in the environment. They'll start to find pollen first. They might find some propolis. And then of course they start finding nectar as things start blooming. But the pollen is what they'll start bringing in first. And that's when they're going to use resources like your stored honey or your emergency rations like the sugar, hive alive, fondant, whatever you've put in there for them to work with, right? So they're desperate for those resources. They also have scouts going out to other hives to find out if those entrances are defended. If the entrances aren't defended for whatever reason, some colonies don't wake as early as others do. Some colonies don't fly as cold as others do. So they could end up being robbed so the scouts go in there and they start looking at things. So I'm going to ping on this robbing screen. Very inexpensive. By the time you're noticing robbing in your hives, you don't have time to go shopping. So I recommend this is just a piece of plastic that goes right on the front of the hive. It fits an eight frame or a 10 frame standard Langstroth hive. The ears break off, push pins are at the top. You do it in an emergency. You pull open the top entrance here and you leave that open right there. So if we've got a weak colony that's not flying yet, but it's being visited by an adjacent colony, we have to stop that robbing right away. Their memories are excellent. And once they do get resources in there, once they find that honey that's off to the side, away from the cluster that's not being utilized by the cluster inside this colony, the robbing event begins and it's very difficult to reverse. So if you find you've got scouts from this colony over here visiting this colony, get some kind of robbing screen on there. These are by B-Smart Design. There are a lot of other screen methods and things like that, but you can't let that go because it can mean uh, the difference between a colony that survives uh, or just gets completely robbed out by others. So here it says, do I close it back up because I think it's a dead out to prevent robbing? What if I'm wrong? Will it even matter if I keep it open? It does, I would not close it up because you saw a cluster in there and I'm not sure where that cluster was located because it wasn't clear in the question when I pulled the inner cover off, was the cluster up at the top? Did you have to look down through another box to see the cluster down below? Was there honey up above the cluster and things like that? So that colony could still survive. So give them every chance of survival by putting a robbing screen on the front of it right away. So this hive has me baffled, but I now think I lost it and it's very sad. I love my bees and I tried to do everything right. Of course, I won't know why they died until I do an inspection in spring. And that's the second part of it. I've been guilty of this myself through the years. I just, I know it's dead. So I'm going to go ahead and start breaking it down. I'm going to start, you know, getting rid of all the stuff because I don't want the other bees to rob it. And I want to go ahead and take the honey off of it and things like that. Only to find a cluster of bees in a state of torpor in a corner looks like 5,000 or more bees, more than enough to, to continue on. Uh, and I blew it by opening them up too soon. So always wait and see what's going on in spring. And you'll be surprised sometimes. Colonies that you absolutely thought were dead were simply conserving their resources and conserving their energy. Or they had what they needed inside the hive and they weren't flying at all. Only to start flying when meaningful resources were out there and when the temperatures really got up into the mid 60s on a sunny day, all of a sudden that colony is alive. But for those of you who are new going into your first spring, try to make sure that the hives, the bees coming and going from each colony are resident bees. What's one of the ways you can tell if that's happening? You can sprinkle powdered sugar on the bees that are outside the hive. And then you can see when they fly away, if they go right over to another hive, you'll see those white powdered sugar bees going over there. Now you know either they're being robbed by this hive or that hive over there is sending robbers to this hive. Either way, we're going to see the activity. 
The other thing is the colony that's being robbed, the colony that is being victimized by their own neighbors will have bits and pieces of detritus, bits and pieces of wax caps and things like that laying on the landing board so it'll be an unclean landing board. The other thing is bees that have freshly robbed a resource like that, when they get out on the landing board, you'll see their abdomens doing this little corkscrew twirling movement and they'll be like wiggling and adjusting everything because they're getting it all organized and aligned before they fly off back home to tell the others where they can come for a free lunch. So robbing screens, have them be ready for anything. And so that's pretty much all for question number three. Question number four, Chris Nelson, Beaver Creek, Oregon. I have a colony that didn't make it through winter. What is the best process for reusing, cleaning, and preparing the boxes and frames for a new colony? Okay, this is something else that a lot of people are gonna be facing in the springtime when you do have a dead out. The most common questions I get when that happens is, uh, what do I do to the equipment so I can reuse it again? The other thing is, there are frames of honey, capped honey in here. Can I use it? Can I feed it back to the bees? So we're gonna talk about a few things here. Uh, one is when you find that your colony is dead in spring, there's no doubt about it. It's mid sixties, all the other colonies are flying and this one just is doing nothing. So the first thing you wanna do is stop other bees from getting in there to rob it out, cause they will. But when the nectar flow comes in, they'll of course go to other resources. But uh, so now we have to open it up and start getting rid of things. Well, first of all, don't throw everything on the ground in front of or around the hive. Some people pull open frames and propolis and wax and everything else. They start scraping it off and just flipping it on the ground willy nilly all around your hives. You could not put more pheromone, more scent into the air that would attract other robbers and raiders, uh, whether it be wasps, other bees, hornets, all the things that are looking for resources in spring then are attracted now to your mess that you're creating. So one is you're gonna to wanna to contain everything that you take out of there. So I highly recommend you bring over something like a hive butler tote if you want something designed just to hold bee frames. And uh, you're gonna take your frames out of there and you're gonna be able to look at the bees. We need to find out why they died. So now we have to autopsy this hive. Now, if you're unfamiliar with all of the reasons that colonies of bees could die out in spring, this is a great time to call in your mentor. This is a great time to get a hold of your bee club and find out if somebody wants to come and help them evaluate a dead out. And then we can look for things that might be alarm bells regarding reuse of the equipment inside the hive. So if you have that little tiny starved out cluster of bees, you know, they're all angled in the same direction. A bunch of them are in the cells and they're abdomens are contracted and they just dwindled. Often your um, queen could have died through winter and the bees are just clustered together trying to survive the rest of it. On the flip side of that, when you open it up and they're like frozen in motion and you've got a brood frame and they're all equidistant from one another, like why didn't these bees cluster up and continue to stay warm collectively? That's the whole point of social insects is to benefit from the heat, resources, and activities of all the other insects in the same hive. But when they're spread out like that, varroa mites were prevalent during that colony in winter, so they may not have been under control enough. You also need to be able to look at the existing brood that's left and look for indicators of brood disease. Any sign of brood disease, and there are resources, you need to look at pictures, you need to have somebody that knows what they're looking at to tell you, I did a video where I showed sack brood, um, we showed chewed brood and things like that, but you can also have chilled brood. Somebody popped it open, somebody had to look at what's going on, and then what happens is they got chilled, the bees cannot warm them up, they lost the brood, open larvae and things like that, they died in place, and now the bees that are wintering, that are just trying to survive, had to turn to the task of cleaning them out. If there weren't enough bees in the colony to perform those functions, then now they're all just dying in place. And those dead uh, larvae that got chilled from eggs on up, then they're just there and they're incapable of cleaning everything out. So you need to make a meaningful evaluation. So we pull all the frames out. It's a great time, by the way, to look at the oldest and darkest frames in the hive, the coffee colored frames. 
uh, which is where the brood is concentrated and also where the potential for brood disease might exist. Now that doesn't say that the bees don't walk all over and spread pathogens all over the hive. They do, it would just be more concentrated in the wax there. So that would be a great time to get rid of that altogether. If it's plastic foundation, you can scrape it off, you can steam it, you can do a lot of things to remove that and then recoat it with fresh hot wax foundation and uh, get those back in service. No problem. If you suspect that there's any kind of foul brood, American foul brood or European foul brood, uh, then you need to really get that tested. You need to find out what you're dealing with as it thaws out and warms up and it's going to stink. Foul brood. Now, I'm glad I mentioned that actually because some people will say, I can go up to a hive and I can just smell it and know when it has foul brood. Well, foul brood doesn't often put out a scent at all. So you can have American foul brood and not smell it. On the flip side, you can also have American foul brood and it can smell a lot. Now, dead outs in the spring already smell like a dead animal. It's a stinky mess. So have trash bags and things like that ready to collect all the dead bees. Please don't shake them out and just put them on the ground. Put them right into the trash, contain everything and get rid of it. Or you can put them on your fire if you want to. Same thing with the frames that you pull out that you don't use if they're wooden frames, for example. If you're burning plastic frames, you're putting toxins into the air. So please don't do that. So, but the box itself, the thumbnail for today's video. So I'm glad I get to talk about these things because in the opening picture, I'm holding these up. What is that? That's what I said to myself when I was walking around at the Hive Life Conference in Tennessee. And I saw an exhibit by the Pierce Beekeeping Tool Company. And I saw these irons and I thought, what is that? This would be the perfect scraper. Because we look at uh, bee boxes when we pull them apart, especially in spring. Because any empty boxes that we're taking off or pulling frames out, the dead outs and things like that, it's a great time to refurbish the frames. It also works when we've pulled off supers in the fall, we've taken the honey out, and then uh, we've got these boxes that have propolis and wax and everything on them. These irons caught my attention and I wanted them right away. They were sold out, had to get them through the mail. But these heat up, there's a thermostat built into it. You have to plug it in, so you need an extension cord. But most people are bringing their bee boxes that they're refurbishing right into their wood shop or their shed where hopefully you have an outlet. This is the one I wanted. They function exactly the same. Their edges are very sharp and these get very hot. These are not the same as uncapping knives. Uh, the owner of this company told me that there is going to be a cooler operating version that would be just for cleaning out uh, and uncapping hives during uh, honey extraction processes. But this is for bee box refurbishment and that superheat, I want to run this across. Now keep in mind, this is theory because I haven't done a practical test on these. I just got them. Uh, but I'm very excited to have them and they're copper underneath this cladding. So they generate the heat, they get very hot, and you're going to be able to either scrape along to scrape propolis and wax off of the hive, or this is what I anticipate, where I see the propolis, propolis, whatever you want to call it. I want this heated scraper to go along and I want it to heat up the propolis and I want it to melt down and smooth onto the surface of the wood as I go. And I want to smooth that beeswax down onto the wood as I go. And I need to keep it going quick enough so it doesn't. we don't want to fire. We don't want uh, beeswax fires. So because these get really hot, don't lay it flat like an iron. Use the edge and move it along. And sharpen up all the corners and all those rabbit joints and things like that. Get down in there and scrape things away if you want to. But now we don't have all the little bits. This is how I'm anticipating it's going to work. I won't have all the little bits and pieces of wax and propolis and stuff that goes all over the floor when I'm scraping boxes because I also like to do that on a cold day when it's brittle and it scrapes off. Now I'm going to go the opposite. Warm day, use heat, smooth it out, keep the propolis in there, use it as a sealant. Maybe I want to use it on other things. Maybe I take propolis and wax and I have a new box and I want to do the corners and I just sprinkle it in there and then I'll take something like this iron and this will run into the corner and then I'll be able to melt the wax and propolis in as I go and use it as a joint sealer. 
Who knows? But they have model numbers. Pierce Beekeeping Equipment. Where are these made? Made in the United States of America, state of California. This is model number 401. This is the one I really like, that I really wanted. And this is model number 301. Runs off of 110. Good to go. Made in the United States. Which makes it, does it really make it better than something made like in China or somewhere else? Yeah, it's way better. Way better by exponentially better. Sharp edges. Be very careful. And they come with a little cradle. So you can set them on that to keep the hot piece elevated off. I cannot wait to use these. I mean, I'm not looking forward to any dead outs this spring. But I am looking forward to the fact that if I have that, that temperature might hit sanitizing temperatures. Not sterilizing temperatures, but sanitizing temperatures, and then reheat and reseal everything in the wake of it as it goes. What do you think? I don't think anybody else has used those yet. I think I'm among the first to get them because they're at the Hive Life Conference, and he said they just came out with them. The next thing I'm going to buy from that same company is going to be those um, cut comb squares. They don't even sell them yet. What a teaser. They showed those at the conference. A big handle, same stuff, same quality. Plug it in. It's got a little temperature control on it. And you'll be able to take a shallow super of honeycomb. Do that without foundation. Let the bees build all of it in your upper box. And then you come to do the cut comb. These things do perfect rectangular cutouts. I can't wait for that. I'm looking forward to it. So anyway... Um, Know what you're looking at. Know why they died. If it's a loss of a queen, no brainer. You're good to go. You can reuse everything. Um, but I do recommend that you refurbish the box, that you heat everything, seal things. You can also use that if you've got foundationless frames. Use those hot knives. I think that's going to make super quick work of that. It's not going to be like the uncapping knives that are heated that are very good too. These are running at a higher temperature. Therefore, you work faster and you can scrape away more stubborn things like propolis. So what if you don't have that stuff? Well, then you're just in there with your hive tool and you need to make sure that your hive tool is not being used on other hives either. So hive tools either sanitized in between colonies or better yet, a hive tool for every individual colony in your backyard so that you are not spreading pathogens from one colony to the next with your tools. If you see somebody going from beehive to beehive and they have this dirty, filthy tool with all kinds of wax, propolis, and everything else on it, and they go to the very next hive, they are spreading pathogens potentially. Eliminate the potential by having a hive tool for every single hive. They're not that expensive. So let's see. What is the best process? Reusing. Reuse the wax if it's great, if it's plastic foundation. You can steam it off. I've used Wagner steamers and things like that for it before. And uh, if you're going to try to use wax, of course, now that we're coming into spring, go ahead and run that through a cycle of the freezer. And you can put that in the freezer for 48 hours in bags, take it back out and put them back in service. That's just to make sure no eggs from wax moth larvae and things like that, because that is the normal cycle of a dead out. Even if it's a feral colony in a tree, these things have a purpose. Small hive beetles, wax moths. When a feral colony in a bee tree dies out over the winter time, those things move in and consume all of the old comb, which is actually a good thing there. Because then the next swarm that moves in there will build all new comb because old comb concentrates toxins. See? So anyway, lots of things to do. Food for thought there. Scrape it off, uncap it, reuse it. The honey that's in there. I want to make sure that you understand, please don't feed. If you find frames of capped honey, which there often is, even in dead outs, which is frustrating for people, uh, you can uncap that and spin it out and use that for human consumption. You're much better off not reinstalling it in other colonies to give them a boost kind of thing. Because there again, unless you completely understand why that colony died out, the pathogens can be passed on to other colonies via honey and the wax, of course. So don't share it with other colonies, but definitely render it out in spring and use that honey. That's what I recommend. Question number five. Brad Wamsley, Chester, New Hampshire. Brad Wamsley. Here I was saying Wamsley like it's a place. 
uh, will plastic frames in brood boxes interfere with the thermal regulation of a winter cluster? I'm thinking the plastic will be an insulator and prevent the heat from passing through to the bees on the other side of the frame and be detrimental to the bees' survival in cold climates. So now we're getting into the thermal conductivity of materials. Beeswax, real beeswax, made by the bees, foundationless frame, is going to be the best way for them to heat opposing cells. So when a bee gets in here, and it's a heater bee, and its thorax heats up, and it starts generating warmth right here, it is heating six adjacent cells. So this is a cutaway. We're looking at it from the side. Now there's a thin membrane on the bottom of that cell and the walls of the next uh, side, the frames over there, the cells, are through the center of the bottom of that one. And so now some heat passes through, but the main heating is going to come from the bees that are in parallel with the other cells. So a bee gets into the cell, primarily they're heating the cells around it because that's the most efficient because it's the length of the bee's body their thorax is in there, the thorax is generating the heat, and it's the adjacent ones. Now the heat can generate towards the bottom, but how are they doing it? They're going in head first, so now it's head first, head first, and now we've got this thin membrane between the cells, right? Uh, does plastic stop that from happening? I would say not enough to be significant, but uh, a lot of my brood boxes are foundationless frames, but let's say we want to, so let's say that foundation made by the bees, the wax itself, would be the best. I agree. That's going to be the best conductor. Now, if we go to the other extreme, what if there's wax foundation? Can they stay warm enough to heat both sides? And will bees be able to survive a strong winter on plastic foundation with this impedance of heat going on right there? Uh, I say they still survive with plastic foundation. So now let's head this off at the pass. What if somebody says, okay, well then which plastic foundation would be the best for the bees to be able to transmit heat head to head from one side of the same frame to the other side of the same frame? Which foundation? Well, it goes, uh, goes without saying probably the thinnest plastic foundation on the market would be the least resistant to heat transfer. So which one would that be? Well, right now, the thinnest foundation that I know of, that I physically looked at, and I buy every foundation that comes along just so I can find out about it, would be Premier right now. So Premier foundation is heavy waxed. Heavy waxing is really good to have. Acorn is another foundation that I use. And Acorn is much thicker plastic. So now here's the trade-off. But we're talking about the brood box. So in the brood box, some commercial beekeepers or guys that run these big centrifugal extractors uh, have said that Premier Foundation has the potential to flex out during radial extraction. So those with centrifugal extraction don't have to worry about it. So what is, what are you talking about? Radial centrifugal. So if you're doing a radial extraction, it, they're all spinning like this on an axis and they're pointing away and that's because there's a 13 degree angle in the cells and the wax is going to, the, not the wax, the honey is going to fly out this way. So the compression is this way. Now, the other method is face out. So the centrifugal force, now they're going this way and it pulls away at this. This is where the thin plastic foundation has been reported to possibly flip out. So centrifugal and radial. Centrifugal pulls this way, radial pulls against the face of it. So, but down in the brood box, those frames are not there to be harvested. They're there for brood. So that's where I think Premier foundation would shine if we're talking about plastic foundation in the brood frame because it's thinner if we're concerned exclusively with how much heat will transfer between both sides of those brood frames. So beeswax itself, number one, plastic frames, number two, still works. They do make, they, they do do fine. They do fine with those frames, 
even though it's plastic foundation. But if you really wanted to get down to brass tacks on it, then it would be the thinnest foundation available, Premier. And uh, but I think that they will work, no matter what. Interesting question, science-based question. Uh, the bees make it no matter what, in spite of us. That's the end of question five. Question six. This is from Jen. We've had quite a few cold days here in the Northeast, and a few of my bees are flying in the high 30s, but not in the mid 40s when I would expect them to. And I've been noticing that there are always dead bees on the landing board after very cold nights, not after mild nights. Could they be leaving the hive and immediately freezing to death? Any thoughts on this? Yeah. The reason they're freezing to death and found on the landing boards after the very cold nights is because they're trying to exit the hive. Bees that are dying do everything they can not to die inside the beehive. So on very cold nights, what happens to them instead of a warm night, because here's the comparison. On a very cold night, they're inside, they fell off the cluster, whatever happened, they're trying to get out of the hive. They get out of that entrance, they get out on the landing board, poof, it's too cold, they can't even fly. They need to vibrate, and I've even got great videos where I recorded the audio of the bees exercising their flight muscles and making all these ee, 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 ee sounds as they're warming up without flapping their wings. And because they have to warm up to a minimum temperature, I believe it's around 80 degrees Fahrenheit, their thorax has to get up to temperature so that they're capable of flight. Now, once they're out there, if they hit the cold interface, then they die on the board. They don't demonstrate the ability to generate enough heat to fly in a meaningful way. That's why they end up on the board or they barely get to the edge and they fall off in the snow right there. These bees are protecting the hive by removing their own potentially diseased bodies or just bodies that are dying. So they leave when they're sick, they leave when they're dying of old age, they leave when they are diseased. So that's also the risk of people collecting, oh, they're still alive and put them back in there and then out they go again. They know what they're doing, they're trying to get out. Their flight is arrested at the landing board when it's really cold. On a warmer night, 40s and so on, they can fly a little bit, then they bomb. So that's the explanation for that there. They are freezing to death on the landing board. That's my guess. Question number seven. Ken Charba, Hockley, Texas. I have been keeping bees for many years and have always harvested by the crush and strain method. I've recently started using plastic foundation in a long Langstroth hive. And I was surprised to see how quickly they filled it up with grams of honey. Not having an extractor, I placed a number of frames in a chest freezer. I constructed an extractor and will soon have more full frames. Understanding how detrimental water is to honey, how can I thaw the frozen frames without condensation collecting on the surface and running, ruining the honey? Okay, it is true that capped honey, even capped honey, can still take on moisture through the wax capping if it's in a humid area. And we all know that when we look at a freezer, anything you put in a freezer, while it's cold and frozen, and by the way, there's frost-free freezers, maybe consider that too. But uh, if this freezer we're talking about only has your honey frames in it, you would have a huge advantage, and here's why. When we take something from freezing straight out into warm air, condensation forms on it immediately, right? So if you wanted to eliminate that, and if your whole freezer is nothing but, and by the way, some freezers are not very expensive. These horizontal freezers, you can have racks in them for your frames from your beehives. Because while that honey is frozen and capped and everything in there, it will not crystallize. It will not degrade. It is a great way for long-term storage of uh frames of wax that you've pulled out of your hives that has honey in them that are capped and you want to keep them for an extended period while you collect more before you run your extractor and things like that. Now you can take that uh, horizontal freezer and you can unplug it. You can just turn it off and then leave it sealed, leave it closed up and let it very gradually warm up and then condensation won't occur because it won't be open and exposed to the warmer air for it to condense on. Now let's say you have other things in your freezer and that's not an option. So then you take them 
and I'm going to mention Hive Butler again. Those Hive Butler totes hold 10 frames, 10 deeps each, so one, one deep box. Uh, if you're using medium frames or shallow frames, then it's only going to hold 10 of those too. So, but one of the things is if you can put them in any kind of tote that you can close off and you can close them up with something like desiccant packs, these are called wise dry desiccant packs. And I use them because they're rechargeable and they come in big ones. You can even get, if you've got a lot of space, you can get a dehumidifying bucket like Damp Rid. This thing uh, takes a lot of moisture out of the air, but again, you would have to have a large space to keep that in. So what I do is, put, I put them in Hive Butler totes with desiccant packs, and as they come up to temperature, the desiccant pack takes off the moisture, and also keeps those frames nice and dry up until you're ready to extract them. So it's a good move, but just like I do with photographic equipment, I do a lot of uh, very cold weather photography and video work. And what I do is I put them in insulated packs and uh, I use desiccant packs in there too, but I don't uh, take them immediately into a warm space. I leave them sealed up in their insulated packs. They're surrounded by these nanofiber cloths too, which also absorb moisture, which I'm not saying you should put on your B frames. But by letting them gradually come up to room temperature over a period of hours, that uh, reduces the amount of condensation that forms on them. So desiccant packs, control container, or if the freezer is just for your honey frames, desiccant packs, unplug it and let it just come up to room temperature on its own. Because then you're going to be warming it before, of course, you put it in your extractors. So I hope that's helpful. And... Uh, yeah, that's all I could think of. Question number eight, G's Bees. I'll be receiving two packages of bees from Man Lake this April. Didn't say what kind of bees you're getting. So anyway, members of the local bee club recommend hitting the packages of bees with OA vaporization the same day I home them in my hives. So OA, oxalic acid, vaporization. Do you recommend this too? I could have sworn that I read somewhere to wait a couple of days so they have time to get used to their new home. Is there a chance they will find their new home unlivable if it's filled with the vapor on day one? Okay, I've talked about this before, but since a lot of people are going to get their packages now uh, coming in spring, it's worth noting. So get your pencils out. It's gonna be very complicated, not really. So here's what happens. When the package bees come in, it is in fact a fantastic time to treat that package with oxalic acid vaporization. And the reason is, any Varroa destructor mites that come with those, some people have reported to me that they got packages from different uh, packages and nucleus colonies from different breeders that came loaded not only with mites, but with small high beetles. Bad form for those who are selling those packages. But anyway, you have to assume they have mites on them. When to treat? I do not recommend treating with oxalic acid vaporization on day one when you receive that package of mites or on day one because your goal is to get them hived as quickly as possible and get them going, get them fed and all that other stuff. Do not treat right then with oxalic acid vaporization. But why is that? Well, let me explain why that is. What is in the package of bees? Usually it's a three pound package of bees. The worker bees that are in there were not produced by the queen that's in a cage that's in that package too. So here's your queen cage that will be in there. Here's your package. The bees are inside. You're going to put them in the hive. You're gonna put the queen in the hive. You're gonna hook this queen over one of the frames in the hive and then we're going to dump all your worker bees around them. They're not related. They're still getting acquainted with this queen. They're feeding her through this cage. They're spreading the queen's mandibular pheromone throughout this new cluster of bees. So they're still getting acquainted. So we don't want them to associate their proximity with this new mated laying queen with the stresses that come with the oxalic acid vaporization. So we do want to first hive them up 
put the queen in there and then of course there's a plug in here that there'll be candy in there and you can take the plug out and then they'll be eating through that while they release the queen and so on uh, we want to find the sweet spot I'd like to leave them in your hive and by the way this is just what I do that's what's being asked not telling everybody what to do so the queen's in there we've installed her in the new hive and they've got syrup they've got every reason to stay and then they're getting acquainted with the queen and maybe three or four days in the queen is released and then uh, sometimes they release her much quicker than that but I always recommend that we don't do an inspection or bother that newly installed package of bees for one week to 10 days. And that's because we want them to settle. They don't really like it when we open the hives, no matter how much you think those bees just want to see my happy face. It's people wanting to know stuff for the reason that they just want to know. So leave them alone for a week. Now, why a week? Why a week to 10 days? What can happen? Well, Oxalic acid vaporization is going to have its greatest efficacy on those phoretic mites before they have a chance to get into the reproductive mode, which has to happen when that queen lays eggs, when those eggs hatch on the third day, when the larvae gets sealed over and becomes pupa on the ninth day. Eggs laid, nine days later, capped. So we need to treat with oxalic acid vaporization after that first week before they hit that point where they're going to be capping the brood. That's when you're going to have a very high efficacy and you're going to wipe out varroa destructor mites in there before they have a chance to enter reproductive mode inside those caps. And they won't be associating that oxalic acid treatment with that queen and potentially reject the queen. Fail safe. Let them get settled. But on day one, no. Now, this could also have been misunderstood. I'm not saying it is, but there's another treatment of oxalic acid that is that does not require a vaporizer, does not require respirators and everything else. And that is the oxalic acid dribble method. And there is another method where you can spray it. So it's a sugar syrup with oxalic acid in the sugar syrup, and it gets sprayed on the package when you receive it, hopefully on a hot day, you don't do that to a package that shows up in 50 degree weather and colder and things like that. But it's another approved method of you can spritz them down and now we can get some control. And of course that does not harass your bees in their package. They have sugar syrup as far as they know and the oxalic acid, the sugar syrup is the vehicle for that. It is less effective than oxalic acid vaporization. So that could be what they were suggesting on day one, because that happens while they're still in the package before it gets put into the hive. The other thing, uh, yeah, so that's, that's pretty much in a nutshell. A week to 10 days, oxalic acid vaporization, knock those mites down more than 90% uh, efficacy. Great opportunity to do that. That was the last question of the day. Now we're on to fluff. That's right. Now, what website did I give a shout out to today? I promise that every week now I'm going to give a shout out to another YouTube uh, channel so you can go and check it out. And it was supposed to be something relevant to some question that was asked today, but uh, there weren't really any that were relevant. So I'm just going to, I'm grabbing one. And I dropped a hint earlier because I held up this here coffee cup. Nature's Image Farm. They also have a podcast about bees, The Contrary Farmstead. So this was given to me by Greg from Nature's Image Farm. He did an interview with me. So that's going to be my shout out today. Check out Nature's Image Farm. And why should you be looking at that YouTube channel anyway? Well, because pretty soon there's going to be an interview on that channel with me. We're going to talk about bees. So that's going to be my YouTube channel shout out today. Uh, the next thing is, thank you for the coffee cup. It's fantastic. And uh, the other thing that I'm going to remind you about is there are people that get their bees through winter. Everything looks great. Early spring, they're flying, they're bringing in pollen, all kinds of cool stuff is going on. And then a couple weeks after that, we have a meeting and, and they died. They starved last minute. We are coming into February. This is the last Q&A for January. 
So now we get into February. That is when, in the northeastern United States, most colonies die from what? Starvation. Because they're all up in the top of their hives going into February. They're starting to produce brood in February, which increases demand on resources because they have to generate more heat because they have to keep their brood warm and humid, by the way. And so I'm going to reaffirm it. Wow, this is too bright. But anyway, hive alive fondant. That's what I'm using this year. Half my hive fondant, half my hive sugar. They're using the fondant. It is not leaking air through the top. They are not using as much of the rapid round with the sugar because they have to go up through the center of the rapid round and get to the sugar and we haven't had any warm days lately. So the fondant, because it's a pack that sits over that hole on the inner cover, they seem to move up into that even when the temperatures are cold because the cluster is able to warm it right there. With the rapid round, which these still work by the way, so don't get all upset if this is all you have, but I noticed that it has to be a much warmer day before the bees are going to go up through the central column and out into your sugar that's up here. If you've got a sugar brick laying directly on your inner cover, then that's better too, because now they don't have to travel through this to get to the sugar brick. Sugar brick is right on your inner cover hole and the bees will be eating through that. Those are things that you need to kind of, if you get a warm day, pop the lid a little and keep notes which colony is consuming the most. It seems like the colonies that need it the least are consuming the most. Which is weird. The little colonies that would really be hoping would be kicking up in there. But I have high hopes for Hive Alive Fondant. I just like everything about it. Don't know why. Uh, because Hive Alive works. The stuff that goes into your syrup works. So I'm just hoping in spring that the colonies that have the Hive Alive on it are doing better than the others. But we'll wait and see. If they, if they stink, if they fail, if they're losers, well, of course, I'll explain that. I'll share what I learned. What else do we have? That's about it. So, I want to thank you for spending your time with me here today. I hope that you're not opening your beehives in winter just out of curiosity. And uh, I also hope that your dead outs are going to be few. But if they are, if you've got dead outs to deal with, please bring on board somebody who is good at diagnosing the reason your bees died because it is important to know whether or not you should be reusing those frames, those resources, and that hive itself, depending on why they might have died and which diseases might be present. Thanks for watching. Have a fantastic weekend.